Hi friends, it's Mrs. McCoy. I hope you guys enjoyed your spring break, even though it was probably quite a bit different from spring breaks you've had in the past. Um, if you're like me and you like rainy days, it was probably a good spring break for you. We had a lot of rain this last week. Um, as you can see though, we've got a nice sunny day today. So I'm back in my backyard for our library lesson for today. Today we are reading a picture book biography because March 31st, just a few days ago, was Cesar Chavez Day. And since we weren't in school at the time, I thought maybe some of us did not get to learn about him this year or talk about him. And he is a very important person from history, especially here in California. So we're going to read a biography of his story today. This is called Harvesting Hope, the story of Cesar Chavez. It's by Kathleen Kroll, and the illustrations are by Jushi Morales. You might remember that name, Jushi Morales. She was the author and illustrator of the One Book, One San Diego uh, story that we read, the Dreamer story that we read um, a couple months ago. So you might recognize her art style in this book, Harvesting Hope. Uh, Cesar Chavez, I know some people say Cesar Chavez. That's kind of like the English way of saying his name. Um, he was from Mexico, and in Spanish, you would pronounce it Cesar Chavez. So I'm going to say it that way. But you definitely, in the world, when people talk about him or teach about him, you'll hear it both ways, and both of them are okay. So Cesar Chavez or Cesar Chavez. Harvesting Hope. our title page. Until Cesar Chavez was 10, every summer night was like a fiesta. Relatives swarmed onto the ranch for barbecues with watermelon, lemonade, and fresh corn. Cesar and his brothers, sisters, and cousins settled down to sleep outside under netting to keep the mosquitoes out. But who could sleep? with uncles and aunts singing, spinning ghost stories, and telling magical tales of life back in Mexico. Cesar thought the whole world belonged to his family. The 80 acres of their ranch were an island in the shimmering Arizona desert, and the starry skies were all their own. Many years earlier, Cesar's grandfather had built their spacious adobe house to last forever, with walls 18 inches thick. A vegetable garden, cows, and chickens supplied all the food they could want. With hundreds of cousins on farms nearby, there was always someone to play with. Cesar's best friend was his brother Richard. They never spent a day apart. Cesar was so happy at home that he was a little bit afraid when school started. On his first day, he grabbed the seat next to his older sister, Rita. The teacher moved him to another seat, and Cesar flew out the door and ran home. It took three days of coaxing for him to return to school and take his place with the other first graders. Cesar was stubborn, but he was not a fighter. His mother cautioned her children against fighting, urging them to use their minds and their mouths to work out conflicts. Then, in 1937, the summer Cesar was 10, the trees around the ranch began to wilt. The sun baked the farm soil rock hard. A drought was choking the life out of Arizona. Without water for the crops, the Chavez family couldn't make money to pay its bills. There came a day when Cesar's mother couldn't stop crying. In a daze, Cesar watched his father strap their possessions onto the roof of their old car. After a long struggle, the family no longer owned their ranch. They had no choice but to join the hundreds of thousands of people fleeing to the green valleys of California to look for work. Cesar's old life had vanished. Now he and his family were migrants, working on other people's farms, crisscrossing California, picking whatever fruits and vegetables were in season. When the Chavez family arrived at the first of their new homes in California, they found a battered old shed. Its doors were missing and garbage covered the dirt floor. Cold, damp air seeped into their bedding and clothes. 
They shared water and outdoor toilets with a dozen other families, and overcrowding made everything filthy. The neighbors were constantly fighting, and the noise upset Cesar. He had no place to play games with Richard. Meals were sometimes made of dandelion greens gathered from alongside the road. Cesar swallowed his bitter homesickness and worked alongside his family. He was small and not very strong, but still a fierce worker. Nearly every crop caused torment. Yanking out beets broke the skin between his thumb and index finger. Grapevines sprayed with bug-killing chemicals made his eyes sting and his lungs wheeze. But lettuce had to be the worst. Thinning lettuce all day with a short-handled hoe would make hot spasms shoot through his back. Farm chores on someone else's farm instead of his own felt like a form of slavery. The Chavez family constantly talked about saving enough money to buy back their ranch. But by each sundown, the whole family had earned as little as 30 cents for a whole day's work. As the years blurred together, they spoke of their ranch less and less. The towns weren't much better than the fields. White trade-only signs were displayed in many stores and restaurants. None of the 35 schools that Cesar attended over the years seemed like a safe place either. Once, after Cesar broke the rule about speaking English at all times, a teacher hung a sign on him that read, I am a clown. I speak Spanish. How horrible is that? He came to hate school because of the conflicts, although he liked to learn. Even he considered his eighth grade education a miracle. After eighth grade, he dropped out to work in the fields full time. It just makes me so sad that he had such a horrible experience at school. His lack of schooling embarrassed Cesar for the rest of his life, but as a teenager, he just wanted to put food on his family's table. As he worked, it disturbed him that landowners treated their workers more like farm tools than human beings. They provided no clean drinking water, rest periods, or access to bathrooms. Anyone who complained was fired, beaten up, or sometimes even murdered. So, like other migrant workers, Cesar was afraid and suspicious whenever outsiders showed up to help. How could they know about feeling so powerless? Who could battle such odds? Yet, Cesar had never forgotten his old life in Arizona and the jolt he had felt when it was turned upside down. Farm work did not have to be this miserable. Reluctantly, he started paying attention to the outsiders. He began to think that maybe there was hope. And in his early 20s, he decided to dedicate the rest of his life to fighting for change. Again, he crisscrossed California, this time to talk people into joining his fight. At first, out of every hundred workers he talked to, perhaps one would agree with him. One by one, this was how he started. At the first meeting Cesar organized, a dozen women gathered. He sat quietly in a corner. After 20 minutes, everyone started wondering whether the organizer was going to show up. Cesar thought he might die of embarrassment. Well, I'm the organizer, he said, and he forced himself to keep talking, hoping to inspire respect with his new suit and the mustache he was trying to grow. The women listened politely, and he was sure that they did so out of pity. But despite his shyness, Cesar showed a knack for solving problems. People trusted him. With workers, he was endlessly patient and compassionate. With landowners, he was stubborn, demanding, and single-minded. He was learning how to be a fighter. In a fight for justice, he told everyone, Truth was a better weapon than violence. Nonviolence, he said, takes more guts. It meant using imagination to find ways to overcome powerlessness. More and more people listened. 
One night, 150 people poured into an old abandoned theater in Fresno. At this first meeting of the National Farm Workers Association, Cesar unveiled its flag, a bold black eagle, the sacred bird, sacred bird of the Aztec Indians. La causa, the cause, was born. It was time to rebel, and the place was Delano. Here, in the heart of the lush San Joaquin Valley, brilliant green vineyards reached toward every horizon. Poorly paid workers hunched over grapevines for most of each year. Then, in 1965, the vineyard owners cut their pay even further. Cesar chose to fight just one of the 40 landowners, hopeful that others would get the message. As plump grapes drooped, thousands of workers walked off that company's fields in a strike, or huelga. Grapes, when ripe, do not last long. If you don't know what a strike is, that's when workers all together collectively refuse to work so that they can send a message to the landowners or the employer of what they want and what they think is that they're doing wrong. The company fought back with everything from punches to bullets. Cesar refused to respond with violence. Violence would only hurt La Causa. Instead, he organized a march, a march of more than 300 miles. He and his supporters would walk from Delano to the state capitol in Sacramento to ask for the government's help. Cesar and 67 others started out one morning. Their first obstacle was the Delano police force, 30 of whose members locked arms to prevent the group from crossing the street. After three hours of arguing, in public, the chief of police backed down. Joyous marchers headed north under the sizzling sun. Their rallying cry was, Si sí, se puede, or yes, it can be done. The first night, they reached Ducor. The marchers slept outside the tiny cabin of the only person who would welcome them. Single file, they continued, covering an average of 15 miles a day. They inched their way through the San Joaquin Valley, while the unharvested grapes in Delano turned white with mold. Cesar just developed painful blisters right away. He and many others had blood seeping out of their shoes. The word spread. Along the way, farm workers offered food and drink as the marchers passed by. When the sun set, the marchers lit candles and kept going. Shelter was no longer a problem. Supporters began welcoming them each night with feasts. Every night was a rally. Our pilgrimage is the match, one speaker shouted, that will light our cause for all farm workers to see what is happening here. Another cried, we seek our basic God-given rights as human beings. Viva la causa. Eager supporters would keep the marchers up half the night talking about change. Every morning, the line of marchers swelled, Cesar always in the lead. On the ninth day, hundreds marched through Fresno. The long, peaceful march was a shock to people who were unaware of how California farm workers had to live. Now, students, public officials, religious leaders, and citizens from everywhere offered help. For the grape company, the bad publicity was becoming unbearable. And on the vines, the grapes continued to rot. In Modesto, on the 15th day, an exhilarated crowd celebrated Cesar's 38th birthday. Two days later, 5,000 people met the marchers in Stockton with flowers, guitars, and accordions. That evening, Cesar received a message that he was sure was a prank. But in case it was true, he left the march and had someone drive him all the way through the night to a mansion in wealthy Beverly Hills. Officials from the grape company were waiting for him. They were ready to recognize the authority of the National Farm Workers Association, promising a contract with a pay raise and better conditions. Cesar rushed back to join the march. On Easter Sunday, 
When the marchers arrived in Sacramento, the parade was 10,000 people strong. From the steps of the state capitol building, the joyous announcement was made to the public. Cesar Chavez had just signed the first contract for farm workers in American history. The parade erupted into a giant fiesta. Crowds swarmed the steps, some people cheering, many weeping. Prancing horses carried men in mariachi outfits. Everyone sang and waved flowers or flags. They made a place of honor for the 57 marchers who had walked the entire journey. Speaker after speaker, addressing the audience in Spanish and in English, took the microphone. You cannot close your eyes and your ears to us any longer, cried one. You cannot pretend that we don't exist. The crowd celebrated until the sky was full of stars. The march had taken its toll. Cesar's leg was swollen and he was running a high fever. Gently, he reminded everyone that the battle was not yet over. It is well to remember there must be courage, but that in victory, there must be humility. That means not to, to be a good sport, not to have too much ego, to be humble. Much more work lay ahead, but the victory was stunning. Some of the wealthiest people in the country had been forced to recognize some of the poorest as human beings. Cesar Chavez had won this fight without violence, and he would never be powerless again. And then there's an author's note with more information about his life. <clears throat> that was Harvesting Hope the story of Cesar Chavez. If you're interested in learning more about him, the movement that he did to help farm workers, you can check the links below or the file attached in Google Drive. I'm going to put some more resources for you. Um, so yeah, his Cesar Chavez Day is celebrated on his birthday, which was March 31st. And then Easter Sunday was another important day because that was when they reached the state capitol and made the announcement that they had come to an agreement with the owners of the land that they were protesting against. One thing to to remember is that we still have farm workers that work in the fields today and they're super important to our um, our whole food system getting food from the fields into the distribution centers to the grocery stores and into our homes so right now we're talking a lot about the essential workers people who are working really hard to make sure that we still have the things that we need people like our doctors and nurses in the hospitals our grocery store workers keeping the stores open um, our police and firefighters and emergency services, our teachers who are working to have um, you guys still have lessons at home and still be able to have access to your education. We have all of those people who are working so hard. But one thing to remember is before the grocery store workers and the warehouse workers and the truck drivers, there are still people that are out there working in the field super hard every day to pick our fruits and vegetables so that we can have the food that we need. So keep that in mind um, as we uh, as we think about having gratitude and appreciation for all of those people who are working so hard in this crazy time that we're in right now. Um, that was Harvesting Hope, the story of Cesar Chavez. So check out the links that I'm going to add so you can learn a little bit more about him and why we celebrate him each year, um, why he was so important for making sure that laborers, people who work, who um, are migrant farm workers, that they have rights and that they're treated fairly and that they're protected. So that was it for today. I will talk to you guys again for your library time next week. I hope that you all are staying safe and healthy and happy. Keep reading, keep growing your brains, and I'll see you all next time. Bye.